Alto, California. It's the Cube at Pier 2.0. Brought to you by the Pier 2.0 Foundations. Learn, connect, and grow. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everyone here live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. Here live at the Peer 2.0 Conference, a grassroots movement of internet engineers working on the next generation, peering all the goodness around running big networks. Our next guest is David Siegel, Senior Director, Internet Service Products for Layer 3 Product Management. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So uh, first tell us, what is, what is Peer 2.0? Explain to the folks out there, what's going on? It's the first of its kind event. It seems to be kind of a, uh, an establishment of a new guard of next generation experts from Gen 1 to, <laughs> or whatever origination to what's, what's next for, for networks. So what, tell us what is going on here. Uh, well, Peer 2.0 is trying to be an educational institute for building up those next set of engineers. Um, and so far it seems to be a very broad mix of people from diverse backgrounds. Some of it, uh, you know, Jay Adelson spoke this morning uh, about kind of the history uh, of uh, the peering world from his perspective, uh, you know, which is, which is great, uh, kind of seeing his point of view. Um, I, I've, you know, touched base with him at various points in my career from different perspectives, so that, that, that's, that's kind of nice to have that. And I think everybody uh, who's considering getting into the network engineering space they, they need to have a sense of where we came from to understand uh, where we want to go. Uh, so I think, it's a, I think it's a great forum for that. There's, there's also, there's, there's a lot of different ways to accomplish peering these days too, so there needs to be a good educational forum to help people understand uh, what the options are for designing a network that's going to enable them to accomplish their peering goals. A lot of uh, action going on. We've been covering obviously VMworld for five years now, and certainly with the Nucera acquisition of software-defined networks and just the just cloud and virtualization just have created huge opportunities in, in, in the enterprise space. But now at the network level, what's the key thing that you're seeing uh, in the evolution of the internet? Obviously, you know, you got the carriers, you've got peering, you have in interconnection. What's changing? What are the key threshold issues that are being discussed in this community? Well, I, I think uh, the, the big thing for, for my company that we've been involved in lately is the net neutrality discussion. Uh, net neutrality is a, is a huge issue uh, right now. It actually has been for many years, but it's getting a lot, more, a lot more press. And as a network provider of services to, to carriers and to content providers, uh, net neutrality is incredibly important uh, to us uh, that that be maintained. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time uh, explaining to regulators, the Department of Justice in the United States, uh, why peering is important, uh, how it works, and, and how it either benefits or detracts from the consumer experience. Uh, and I don't think this, uh, this conference has quite touched on too much of that yet, but uh, I did a little bit in, in my talk this morning, uh, and, and that, that's certainly a big issue. So let me, let me dig a little deeper in that and follow up because it, it's hard enough for the tech people to keep up with the tech in the world that we live today. Uh, for governments and government regulators uh, in Washington and other places, it's got to be even harder. So I wonder for the folks at home that maybe aren't as familiar with kind of what the core issues are that are being kicked around on the, on the net neutrality discussion, if you can kind of dive in a little bit and, and talk about the, the two or three kind of main topics and the, and the two different points of view uh, on those items. Yeah, the, the, the main, the main issue from our perspective is uh, that there's a monopolistic situation uh, in this country. There's, uh, there's not enough competition for broadband. Uh, if you're uh, uh, someone at home, you probably have two choices, or maybe three, um, and they're completely different choices. On the one hand, you might have your old telephone company who offers DSL services. Uh, you might have uh, a cable modem. Uh, and then less desirable options for getting internet access at home would be wireless or satellite. Uh, that's not a great competitive dynamic, right? Um, if your telephone company service is not great in your area, cable is all you have. And essentially your cable company or your telephone company, if they're really your only choice, they can kind of hold you hostage. Uh, you buy service from them and you get what you get. And uh, they're under no obligation to increase quality if you don't have a choice. And so what we've been trying to educate folks about is, is the business aspects that are in play with a lot of these providers, where they create a competitive situation where uh, they get paid on both sides. So they not only get paid by you as a home subscriber for your service, 
um, but they create an environment where they can also charge every application that you want to use. So for example, um, uh, Comcast uh, has done a deal with Netflix to ensure that Netflix pays them directly in order to have higher quality service so that your Netflix doesn't buffer as much at home. That increases the cost of the Netflix service and makes them less competitive compared to Comcast's own TV service that they want to sell you. Now, was that just some smart guy sitting at Comcast figured out that there's a new product that I can now sell back to Netflix in terms of a, a quality of service? Or what happened before kind of this poster child case kind of elevated into the public consciousness? Well, there was a time way back when, when Comcast was buying service from, from other folks. Um, they didn't have the market power uh, that they have now. Uh, and they peered with folks and performance was relatively good. Uh, what they did is uh, once they were on sort of an equal footing with various tier one carriers, um, they then uh, found excuses not to upgrade. And so what happened is over time, all of the interconnection capacity that they have filled and became congested. Mm. And that became the vehicle for any customer sitting behind a congested route. And essentially, all routes that were not paid to Comcast became congested over time because they didn't upgrade any of them. So then, the, it wasn't a technology play that created this quality of service issue, it was pure business. If I refuse to upgrade unpaid connections, only paid connections get the good performance. And so that's what they've been able to maneuver. And multiple carriers have been able to maneuver themselves into a situation where if you want to have good performance to their customers, you have to develop a re direct relationship with them that involves you paying them. So a one or two for the folks at home, if you can just give kind of the, the peering 101 overview of, you know, the, the vision is right, without peering, you throw stuff into the ocean, the packets go swim around and they reassemble at the other end. Talk about kind of the open internet versus a peering relationship and why that's so important for the internet expectations that we have today and why this becomes really a business conversation and not a technology conversation. Well, there really is not much difference between the two. There, this concept of an open internet uh, it is really kind of a, it's a tier of the internet that exists between uh, smaller players, um, players that uh, have to try to develop competitive advantages and they do that any way they can. They do that by um, improving the relationships that they have uh, with other carriers, uh, establishing that direct connectivity to improve performance without having to rely on a tier one and trying to avoid as much of the, the performance issues created by net neutrality as they can. But sooner or later, if you're, if you're selling to people at home and you have a service that is bandwidth sensitive, you have to overcome that problem. So net neutrality will eventually impinge upon anyone who begins to become successful. And that's what folks need to understand is that uh, the, the regulatory bodies in this country who are today letting businesses work these things out on their own uh, are being negative, negatively impacted by the fact that not everyone has, uh, not everyone has earnest uh, intentions um, at heart. Not everyone is motivated by improving the quality of the product that they sell. Um, when the product, you know, take the, uh, the cable modem or the, the cable broadband industry has uh, a worse rating on the consumer index scale than airlines. And yet those companies... That was, and that was before the video, the audio piece came out. That right, was on Comcast. The Comcast guy. <laughs> they continue to add <laughs> subscribers every single month, even though people do not like doing business with them. Well, we saw this movie before, during the SELEC days, you know, the policy guys got in and lobbied the laws, so the battles are usually lost before they've been fought on the, on the government side. That's, we've seen that before. But I want to ask you more importantly around net neutrality now as the policy game continues, wh what's the innovation impact? So as people look at this, and they try to make it so complicated, the proponents and the, the war of net neutrality makes it complicated so people don't understand the issues. But let's try to narrow it down to innovation. Where's the impact to innovation and startups? Who would die, who would not be around today if net neutrality uh, was not in place, or in place going back 15 years ago? Which companies would not be around today, in your opinion? Google, YouTube, Netflix, would there be that kind of innovation? It's hard to say uh, you know, if there's any big players today that, that wouldn't still be, still be around, um, but conceivably, uh, Netflix, 
Uh, imagine if uh, when Netflix had 10 users and no content, if every time you tried to watch something you got a buffering signal. They, they, they might not have made they, it before. They never <laughs> would have made it to the point where they yeah. could develop their own content that people wanted to see. Right, although mm -hmm. they had the alternate distribution method, so at some, at some point the economics and or the ease flipped where they didn't have to ship DVDs anymore and, and, and it became okay to do the streaming. Well, he's talking about critical mass. At some point, right. every company that's been involved in the freedom of the internet was, to get some critical mass, that, the tipping point kicks right. in. And right. so the question that's the issue here is that where's the innovation tipping point if there's so much stringent policy and costs involved? You can't monetize that, you got to get it funded, and that's just a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Maybe people would still be um, getting their DVDs and their Blu-rays in the post. In the mail. Uh, instead of being able to deliver them over the internet. The innovation is incredibly important in that respect to what, how people want to use their internet service. There's a massive hunger towards using their internet connection more and more. Your right. kids are on it all the time. Right. They're on instant messaging, they're texting, and they're on the internet all the time. In the what about the impact of something like, right, we're, we're very close to Google, Google goes into Mountain View and, and other communities and starts setting up basically a Google-sponsored Wi-Fi overlay. Um, is that the type of, of uh, kind of competitive alternative that people need to potentially break the log jam, or is, is that just not really, the, the relative scale in terms of the bandwidth and throughput still well, not very big? I think what Google's trying to do is not to change the market, but they're trying to demonstrate that the market is changeable, that there is an opportunity for new players to come in and do something different and be able to make money in the broadband space and create competition. Whether or not they themselves become the competition in the, in the long run remains to be seen, and I think they've stated that's not their strategy. Right. But everything about how they have approached things is to, is to kind of demo, publicly demonstrate, yes, community Wi-Fi works. Yes, community uh, fiber co-ops uh, through Google Fiber can work, and people can come in and they can create competition and uh, create new services that consumers want to buy and do it at a rate that performs better than the competition and has just as, you know, has all the service bells and whistles. What is the key points that people are fighting over right now, in your opinion, just at a, at a thought leadership level and also at a technical level? What are the big battlegrounds? Obviously you mentioned net neutrality. Outside of net neutrality, what are the big threshold issues that are being kind of uh, uh, talked about and worked on? Uh, well, obviously the cloud is a big industry buzzword uh, right now. Uh, there's a lot of people figuring out exactly what this means uh, to them, uh, and there's definitions uh, are plenty plentiful uh, throughout, uh, throughout all businesses. Um, one of the things we're trying to figure out is uh, how customers view um, the value of their own data center um, as the applications move out of their data center into the cloud environment and their per their software purchasing models change, um, what do they feel is missing? And so we've been investing a lot of time with customers and with cloud providers trying to understand how we can solve for some of the gaps like security and SLAs and things like that by, by taking these cloud platforms that exist and connecting them directly in MPLS VPNs, which is, you know, doesn't use the internet, um, but still enables the customer to have an SLA and also buy the software, the service, um, in the manner that, that, they, that they want to that drove them to consider that cloud purchase in the first place. So this is like the AWS Direct Connect that we hear a lot about. Right. Okay. It's a level three's Cloud Connect service okay. that, we, uh, that we launched where we're, we're enabling our MPLS customers to get that, that direct pipe directly into those popular cloud services without using the internet. So that, that's a pretty big topic and, and uh, you know, obviously a lot of folks uh, moving moving more and more of their applications into the cloud and relying on someone else to provide that infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I wonder when we will see the day in which enterprises start to shut down their internal data centers because they don't have any applications in them anymore. Well, that was going to be my question, because you've been in this space for a long time, right? Level 3's been a, been a player in, the, in the, the data center space and the colo <laughs> space and the managed service for a long, long time, and you've been there. And I was going to say, have you seen anyone, even though they light up new applications in cloud instances, actually take down and remove boxes uh, from, from the installations that they have with you guys? 
or is it still more additive? Sure, we see say? customers go through cycles. Uh, usually it's a, it's a buying attitude in that company that drives that decision. So a CIO, a new CIO comes in, wants to make his mark on the organization and says, I'm going to take all these MPLS connections out and we're going to run everything over the internet. Uh, and so you'll see that switch. And then five years later, another CIO will come in and say, what are we doing? We've got no quality of service, no guarantees from our provider. We've got to build an MPLS network. So you see this kind of dynamic pendulum shift back and forth between these different approaches to doing business. Some people want to insource uh, all of as much as they can, do all their own network management in-house. Other people want to outsource that using uh, simple managed services and things like that. So we see that, we see that pendulum go back and forth with customers all the time. Uh, I couldn't say that, that there's been a, a specific trend um, where cu customers are definitely moving uh, in one direction versus the other. We see a little bit of cross-pollination going back and forth, but generally speaking, we see both our internet product and our MPLS products and our managed services products all growing faster than the market, all taking market share um, and, and continuing to be very healthy. Dave, my final question for you is for the, for the 2.0 community here. How do you see this group evolving? Obviously there's some business models uh, developing. Uh, IIX just got recently scored funding from NEA. Uh, there's still innovation to be had as well as this you know, grassroots organization of experts that are coming together. What do you see, how do you see Pier 2.0 evolving? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't been involved that long. It's a brand new, it's a brand new organization. A lot of that depends on the kind of people that it attracts. Um, my understanding is that there's, uh, there's obviously some industry veterans here. A lot of them have, uh, have are speaking uh, at the conference to share their knowledge and their history uh, with, uh, with the newer generation. I understand about 25% of the audience are students today, which is also, uh, also pretty exciting to see students taking a, a big interest in, in this. Um, the presentation that I gave today talks a lot more about the business aspect of peering and how how do you make the numbers work for something that inherently doesn't have revenue dollars in it, and and so that takes things more into the business realm. And I don't know how many business folks are in the audience today, but uh, definitely need we need to develop uh, the people that are involved in peering to be have both an engineering acumen and a business acumen, and I hope that uh, this forum can do both. Yeah, obviously new people are coming into the industry, younger guns are coming in, mentoring with the old, the old dogs, as they say, <laughs> in the internet days. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming on, really appreciate spending the time. David Siegel here with Layer 3. Uh, this level, is the three. Level, le three. Le level 3. Level 3. Level 3, sorry. We got Layer 42 <laughs> coming on, not to be confused. <laughs> level 3 communications. We'll be right back here live in Silicon Valley after this short break. <laughs>